I'm glad that you are here with us this morning. It's a beautiful day out. We've had several beautiful days, right? We're supposed to get some rain this week, which we need, I hope. And, uh, and I'm ready to worship the Lord today. How about you? If you're watching online or listening on the phone, Miss Alice, we are glad that you're with us. This is First Baptist Church of Welcome. I am Pastor Mark, and we're ready to get our Jesus on, right? Anyway, today we're reading out of uh, Judges uh, 2, 6 through 12. And when Joshua had led, let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in, I have no idea how to say that word, Timnath Harris, in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. And also all that gen uh, generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which uh, he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. Oh my gosh. Happy Father's Day again for everyone, to all you... You men, soon to be deads, uh, will be deads eventually. Father's Day. So, Dad, any of you guys cooking today? <laughs> That's okay, right? That's what we do. We like to do that. We like to cook on that their grill and whatnot. Oh, the father of five children had won a toy, some raffle. And he called his kids all together, and he asked them which of them, uh, you know, which one of you should get present. They're trying to figure out the fair way to do it. So he said, who's the most obedient? Who never talks back to mom? Who does everything she says? Five small voices answered, okay, Dad, you get the toy. <laughs> Today we honor dads yay that's me seriously you know God our father made us dads right and what an honor it is to be a father to be a, a parent uh, not so easy in this world today however it is an honor to be able to, to call yourself a dad and I say dad because there's a difference between a father sometimes and a dad. You know, any man can be a father. You know, anybody can, can make a child. Any man can make a child, right? But it takes someone special to be a dad. And we'll talk about that a little bit here in a little bit. So we, we set a day apart every year, a Sunday, to to celebrate our fathers in this country. And we're to honor our fathers, not because it's a holiday, not because it's a tradition, not because there are sales going on all over the country. By the way, this is the perfect weekend to buy tools and stuff, just, just saying. Uh, but because God tells us to. Did you know that? In fact, he said so very specifically in Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3, where he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, it doesn't say honor only the good moms and dads. 
It doesn't say honor them if you like them, if they didn't make you mad today, if they didn't give you what you wanted. It doesn't say honor your mother and father because, you know, they, they're not perfect. It says honor your mother and father regardless of what your relationship was or is with them. Honor them. And so today, we're going to honor our fathers. And while I'm speaking to the dads out there today, don't check, check, check out if you're not a dad, because what we're going to hear this morning, we all need to hear. Because we are involved in a war. And the battleground isn't in the Ukraine, it's not in Afghanistan, it's not in China. The battleground is in our homes. And what's at stake isn't our land, it's not our property, not our freedoms. It's more, more important, so much more valuable than that. What's at stake is our kids. And believe me, it is a war and it's the most important war. And in this country, brothers and sisters, we are losing the battle. Children are turning from the faith in record numbers. It says as, as soon as they leave home, as soon as they go to college, they leave the church. And don't think that it's only a problem here. It is all over the country. Children in record numbers are turning away from God. But that's nothing new. It's been happening over the course of time. So I'm going to tell you this, that brief biblical story this morning that, that Jeff wrote, read for us this morning in our scripture in Judges chapter 2, verses 6 through 12. And I'm going to guide us through, through it a little bit. So the little background here on Judges chapter 2, verse 6 through 12, I'm not going to read it again for you. I'm just going to skim over it. The nation of Israel had just marched into the promised land. And they were settling into the land. This is the, God, the, the land that God had, had promised you know, to Moses and the Israelites. Now, it wasn't a complete victory because when they went in, they didn't always follow what God told them to do. And instead of, of conquering all of it, like, like he had told them to, to, to conquer every person, every tribe that was in there, Instead, they just decided they would settle into the parts that they liked, right? <clears throat> and then it was pointed out to them that they, they weren't doing what God had told them to do, so they repented of that. Now, with, it, with that in mind, we go into our, our subject of the, um, of the passage of Scripture. And it goes in to tell us that, that Joshua passed away, right? And then that the next generation, they turn their back on God. And they worship the gods of the people that were around them. Today, brothers and sisters, in 2023, our kids, they don't wait for mom and dad to pass on. They turn away immediately and they worship the God of their cell phones. They worship the God of the internet. They worship the God of convenience. They worship the God of this world. They worship the world. They want what's in here, what's outside. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 tells us, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. In Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32, closely parallels what's going on in America today. So let's look at that really quickly. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate minds to do those things which were not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, decease, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, 
proud boasters, inv inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they will commit such things, are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. In other words, what it says is that today's society, just like then, you do what you want. You know what's wrong. You know what, what goes against God. But they do what they want. Now, there isn't anybody in this room has, who hasn't done what they wanted, knowing that it was against God. Amen? We've all done it. But as we've stated from this pulpit before, today's children get it faster and more abundantly because of all the, the electronics that, that they, they have access to. That the world can, comes into their life every day. And this is not a dig because I'm not on it, but, but how many kids do you, heck, adults, waste hours on TikTok? I know supposedly some of that stuff is funny, right? And it's not a judgment, but how much time is spent on that? And how much junk is on that? I mean, I've, I've shared with, with a lot of you before, uh, several months ago. I mean, holy, I got off Facebook because there's so much junk on there now. So much stuff on there that doesn't belong there, that's access, that has access to, to all of our kids' minds. And, and I have adult kids, and I still worry about that stuff. Do you realize that, that we live in a culture that approves of turning its back on God? That actually, actually promotes turning their back on God? You see it from, uh, you know, from court cases you read about or hear about, to, to, to TV programs, to popular movies and music. And it's okay to make fun of, of Christianity. Because... It's not important anymore. It's not relevant to the world. It worked for mom and dad, but it doesn't work for us today. Religion, my mom and dad's faith, that's their faith. And that's true. Your faith ought to be your own faith. But it should be in God, not in the world. <coughs> But I can tell you this this morning, moms and dads. You are on the front lines. This is a war, and we're called to be a part of that war. I don't care how old your kids are. This morning, I want to give you some marching orders to tackle this important task of saving our children. So we're going to look briefly at a few steps that are going to help us do that, I, I pray. How, we can, how can we win this war? Well, the first suggestion I have this morning is with our words. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, it says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That says we need to talk to our children, not talk at them. There's a difference, right? I mean, I mean, sometimes we do that. We talk at our kids. Sometimes we talk at people we work with instead of talk to them, right? We need to tell our kids about God. We need to tell them about his word. We need to remember to tell them what God has done for us. Tell them your story, how God works in your story. Are you sharing what he's doing in your life? 
What has God done for you? If you're not, you need to. You ought to. It's important that they understand where you stand and where you see God. If all they see is you beating the, the horse every, every week, getting to work and after work, and come home and do your, your, your mother and fatherly duties in the house and do nothing but that, then they're not getting an example. They're not seeing God. They might see you pick up the word. They might see you sitting in a pew on a Sunday morning, but, but if they don't see you living it, if they don't hear it from you, then they're not getting it. And I'm telling you, coming to church on a Sunday morning is not going to give it to them. It gives them a little peace. It gives them a little seed. There was a, a study done a little while ago to determine the interaction between fathers and their small children. First, the fathers were asked to estimate about, about how much time that each of them spent each day uh, communicating with their kid. The average answer was about 15 or 20 minutes a day. So next, what they did is they put microphones attached to the father so that every interaction that they had with the child would be recorded. And then the results of, of this uh, study was shocking. The average amount of time spent with these middle-class fathers with their small children was 37 seconds a day. 37 seconds a day. Sometimes that seems like a long time, depending on the attitude of your kid, right? Their direct interaction was limited to 2.7 encounters a day, lasting 10 to 15 seconds each. Isn't that sad? And there's, there's a myriad of reasons for that. You know, there's things to do. You know, dads are busy. Moms are busy. You know, uh, we, we, we got things that we, that we got to do. But if we look back at, at Deuteronomy 6 again, and these words which I command you th thee this day shall be in thy heart and tells them what to do, you know. Teach my kid, teach your kids diligently. You know, talk about God when you sit down. Talk about Him when you're walking with Him. Talk about Him when you're lying down, when they rise up. Talk about God. Show them God. How can you accomplish any of that in 37 seconds a day? We can't, right? doesn't come close to meeting the criteria to, to, to get that job done. We need to communicate with our children. And I've said this before, and I've said it for years, but I'm going to say it again. We need to do it with our eyes. We need to listen and talk with our eyes. When we talk to our kids, we need to do it by looking at them. We want to communicate so they understand that, that we're connected to them. That we're listening. And we need to tell them about God. We need to tell, tell them about the Bible. Proverbs 1.8 says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Don't let the schools be the only th thing that instructs your kids. See, that's the problem today, you know, and, and though you teachers know that is that people send their, their kids to school and expect the teachers to raise their kids today. Back when I was in elementary school, if you didn't have home training, you got whooped right there in school. That didn't give you, that didn't give you home training because when you got home, you got whooped again, and then more home training. So regardless of what today's society says, that's, that way of working worked. You can't let even this church 
be the only thing that instructs your children. And that's not an indictment, of course, on the teaching ministry of, of, of the church or, or teachers at all. But mom and dad, we're not responsible for raising your kids. We'll help you. That's what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to give you a hand when we can. But when the Bible tells us to train a children in the, a child in the way that they would go, and when he gets old, he, he won't turn for, for, from it, it's talking to the church. I mean, it's talking to the parents. It's not talking to the church. So dads, how you doing with your words? Are you fighting? Are you sharing God with your child? Our second suggestion is how we can win on how we can win the war uh, for our kids is with our time. Robert Schuler, who was the, some of you older people might know, remember the Crystal Palace on TV it was one of the first televised, you know, big churches on TV. And he was the pastor of that church. Um, and he chose to fail so that he could succeed. He said, I chose to fail at golf if I wanted to succeed as a father. Though he loved golf immensely, he knew that he could never devote adequate time to his job, his hobby, and his family. So he gave up his hobby. The problem with most men today is we don't give up our hobbies. We don't give up nothing. We try to spread our life you know, throughout the day and spread ourselves so thin that we give our kids 37 seconds. Our lives are so full. That they don't get enough of us. So how can we share God. In a meaningful way. How are you doing with your time. In verse 7, it says, impress upon them your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And then verse 8 goes on to say, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. In other words, take what God says And show it to your children all the time. Show it to those that you love. Now, I'm saying children. It's going to be your kids, your biological kids. But it's also those young Christians in your life. It's also those, any other person that God has placed in your life that doesn't know God. Because effectively, they are children, right? Dads, do you want to know what's important in your life today? Look at your schedule. Look at what your time is devoted to. And when you see what your, what your time is devoted to the most, that's what's important to you. It's that simple. Unfortunately, so many dads say that by the time, you know, by their time, they love their job. They love their hobbies. They love their entertainment and their comfort. And of course, if you ask them if they love their kids, they're going to say what? Of course they do. But if you look at their schedules, right? The amount of time they spend in everything else and then with their kids is vastly different. And guys, I know we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. You can ask my daughter. She'll tell you. Dad, you're always busy. So this hits me right between the eyes. Some of you have been brought up thinking, you know, that that's the way of the world. You know, we, we, we live, we work, we might play a little, t a little bit, and then we die, Right? We work 
to, and keep on working and work some more so that we can take care of our kids, take care of our families. You know, and, and that's, that's an important biblical truth. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. But see, we go beyond that sometimes. We should provide for our families. But we take it to the next step. I'm going to provide for my family, but I want that boat. Or I want that F-350 crew cabs, dually, four-wheel drive, XLT, Lariat, no, King Ranch. <laughs> You know, so, so that becomes part of the package, doesn't it? So it's not, just, it's not just providing for my family now. Now it's providing for my wants, for my toys, for the things that I feel make me successful. When the whole time what makes you successful, brothers, are those little ones. Those ones that become men and women of the world in Christ, if you do it right. That's what's important. And now you, you know there's a difference between quality of time and quantity of time, right? Kids would love to have both of them, but, but in a recent study, if they had to choose, they would pick the quality of time with mom and dad as opposed to the quantity of time. Better time with you than more time with you if they had the choice. I read this story about a little girl who she drew this pretty picture and she went in her dad's office in, his, in the house and she crawled up in his lap and he said, Daddy, come see my picture. And dad said, not now, honey, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. Daddy's busy. About 10 minutes later, she came back in. She crawled back up on his lap, and she said, Daddy, will you come see my picture now? Dad got frustrated. He says, you, can't you see that I'm busy? Don't bother me right now. I'll come to you and see, you, see your picture a little later when I can, when I'm ready. A couple hours later, the dad came out, and he said to the daughter, can I see your picture now? And the little girl said, sure. It was a picture of her and her brother and her mom standing on the lawn, with the family dog, all with big smiles on a sunny day. But dad noticed he wasn't in the picture. And so dad said, that's a nice picture, sweetheart. But how come I'm not in the picture? And the little girl said, because you're working in your office, daddy. Do you know how many children have that in their minds? How many of us don't spend that time? Guys, I know when we get home, we're tired. You don't want to be messing with a whiny kid, or you don't want to go out and play in the yard. You don't want to do this. You don't want to do that. You want to do what you want to do is sit down and maybe pop a beer and put your feet up and turn TV on or, or read the paper or whatever. Do they even make papers anymore? Yeah. You know, do whatever you know. Do whatever it is you want to do, right? But your kids have been waiting for you to come home, waiting to spend that time with you. They don't know or do. They don't care that you're tired. All they want is time. If your child was to draw a picture of your family today, would you be in that picture? Time is a gift, brothers and sisters. And it's a gift that you can never give back, get back. But it's so important for us to give. You can give money and you always make more, right? You can give gifts away and you can always buy more gifts. But once time is given, it never comes back. And time reveals the priorities in our life. And if you want to win the war for your children, 
You've got to invest time. You've got to give yourselves. Our third and final suggestion this morning on how to win the battle for our children is with our lives. Genesis 18, verses 18 and 19. It says, saying that Abraham shall surely become a great mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, and that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. The way we live our life will be a direct reflection of how our children will grow up. There's a song um, that's called, I Want to Be Just Like You, it, uh, sung by Phillips, Cra Phillips Craig and, and Dean. And the words go something like this. Lord, I want to be just like you because he wants to be just like me. I want to be a holy example for his innocent eyes to see. Help me be a living Bible, Lord, that my little boy can read. I want to be just like you. Because he wants to be just like me. Like I said, my kids are adults now. And I can see the evidence of the good things that Mary and I lived out in front of them. And sadly, I see evidence of the bad things we lived out in front of them. It's kind of like this situation. There's a little boy, he was caught swearing like a sailor. Young man, where did you learn to talk that way? His mother asked him. The boy looked at his father and said, well, Dad, should I tell her? In 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 3, it speaks of a king of Israel named Amaziah. And it says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father, he did according to all things as Joash his father did. What kind of example are you setting for your kids? Your words might say some things about you, but your life declares who you really are. Are you fighting the war with your life? And as we wrap up, I want to talk to you kids that are still here. Life isn't always what we want. It isn't always what's best. It isn't always pleasing to God. There are some of you here this morning who have dads that, that aren't all that great. Maybe not even be there. How can you honor your father even when it's difficult? How can you go through life without a good father? First and foremost, you have the best father. You have Father God. He's always there. He always listens. He always loves you, has always loved you. And if you happen to be in this church and, and or, or listening online or on the phone, and your father's not around, we call this church a family. You feel like you need to talk to somebody that could be a father for you or a father figure, all you got to do is pick up the phone. All you got to do is reach out. And I can't think of one man here that won't stand up and fill the gap for you as good as they can to be there to help you. All you got to do is be strong and reach out. There's a story of these young boys. They were having that com conversation, that debate of, of whose father was the best. 
And this particular conversation, you know, is highlighting who their fathers knew. That's who made them the best, you know, their, their connections. First boy, he started the debate by saying that his father knew the mayor. He was soon topped by the second boy who said, that's nothing. My dad knows the governor. Stakes were getting pretty high. And there was this father that was kind of eavesdropping on the conversation. And he said, that's nothing. My dad knows God. Would your child say that about you? May our children always say that my mom or my dad knows God. Can they tell by your life, by your words, by your time? Will they say that? See, we're in a battle. And though my kids are adults, I still have to stand in the gap for them. I pray for them every day. I'm sure you all do. I pray for your children in this world because they're important to me, to this church, to the kingdom of God. You are the future of the church and, and it's up to us to show them God every day to tell them about God every day. I pray our hearts are lean that way. Brothers and sisters, I am thankful for each of you. I'm thankful for, for your decision to become parents. And even if you didn't make that decision consciously, <laughs> If it just happened, <laughs> God is still good. And he gives us those gifts for the better. For a reason. Are we going to do something about that? Because he's given us our marching orders. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are certainly the best example of a dad. And my brothers and sisters here know that my favorite term for you is Abba, which means daddy. And you are our daddy in heaven, that you love us warts and all, even when we're the ugliest. When our soul is the darkest, you stand there and you wait for us. Your spirit leads and guides us, picks us up when we fall. Oh my goodness, we thank you for that. And you loved us so much that you sent your son here to take away all our sins, all the blackness on our soul. You raised him three days later so that we can live with you forever in heaven when he defeated death on that resurrection morning. You loved us so much. And you will love us through eternity. Thank you, Father, for giving us an example of, and the examples in, in your word of, of what a good father is, what a good parent is. I pray that your spirit moves in our hearts and in our minds. And as we go on from here on out, that, that we just show our kids the love that is you, the love that is Christ Jesus, our Lord. I ask that you might bless every man, woman, and child here today, Father, all those that are listening. May you guide our steps and guide our hearts. We pray all of this in that mighty name, that precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. All God's children said, amen. Isn't he great? Amen. Isn't he great? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Amen? Amen. There's no challenge for you this week, guys. I hit you right between the eyes with plenty to think about, right? Not trying to, I'm, not just, I'm just trying to give us weapons to fight the world with. Because we need those. We need those. We need to be attacking the world with what God has given us. And that's His Son, Jesus Christ, His Word, and us. Us. We can be God's sword in this world. But we have to share God. We have to share His Word. Right? Can you do that? Moms and dads? Brothers and sisters? Every one of you? Absolutely we can. I know that you can. God bless you. I love you. Enjoy your days, Dad. Your day? Well, yeah, all your days. <laughs> but especially today, right? I'm thankful for each of you. God bless you. Peace, I'm out. Marky Mark. You pray us out. with this nation, start a revival that can spread and save this nation. Thank you for all the fathers in our lives. Bless each and every one of us and direct us to where we're trying to get.